So uh, thank, thank you. More seriously, thank you to, to my colleagues, Ruth Farrell and Jessica Berg, for organizing this event, and of course to Max Melman and others at the Law Medicine Center for hosting us for this conference. It's my privilege to introduce our, our speaker here, Dr. Stephen Ralston. He's the Division Director of, in Maternal Fetal Medicine at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Ralston trained in medicine at Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons in New York. He then completed residencies in obstetrics and gynecology at Yale and a fellowship in maternal and fetal medicine at Tufts Medical Center. He's the chair of the ACOG Ethics Committee and has longstanding interest in the ethics of uh, in professionalism uh, in the context of obstetrics and gynecology. Dr. Ralston. Thank you. It's uh, really such a pleasure to be here. It's um, sort of like um, old home week for me. I'm seeing Barbara, who was really at the beginning of my career um, when I was a fellow, and I got to serve on a committee at the Hastings Center where I met Barbara. And then Annie and Ruth were on the ACOG Ethics Committee with me, and then Jessica at AAP, and then I met Elizabeth at the bar last night. So <laughs> uh, all of my friends are here. Um, so I. Uh, you know, we, we physicians are sort of, it's sort of drilled into our heads to talk about disclosures at the beginning of our talk. So I am the chair of the ACOG Ethics Committee. Um, um, I'm also a board member of Planned Parenthood. I think you should know that about me before I go much further. Um, I am a practicing maternal fetal medicine specialist. I'm not going to tell you which way my toilet paper goes, but I am very, very sensitive. Um, <laughs> And um, I am pro-choice, you should know that too. And I'm an abortion provider and I have a specialty in late pregnancy termination, especially patients with fetal abnormalities. So I have been steeped in this issue for a long time. And um, a lot of what I'm gonna talk about is coming from the front lines of what this means sort of in reality and not just in the ivory tower. So I'm gonna talk about sort of how our technologies affect pregnant women and um, the doctors that take care of them. And then what are goals of prenatal diagnosis and how they've changed and how this affects women too. So we have come a long way, baby. This is an ultrasound picture from the early 70s. And for those of you who don't read ultrasounds, there's nothing there to see. You can't tell anything except maybe there's a head there and that's about it. And then you look at this ultrasound picture and all of you recognize this as a fetal profile. But I can tell you as an MFM, this is crap, okay? This is a bad ultrasound picture. It doesn't tell us much, it's all this artifact at the beginning. And really we want much more detail where we can see fine um, uh, anatomy of the heart. I really wanna have a microphone that I can walk around with. Can you hear me still? Does this work? Does this work now? Okay, okay, okay. So like we can see like the fine architecture of the spine, of the abdomen, of the heart, much, much more information than we would get from those really primitive ultrasounds. And then of course we have 3D ultrasound now and everybody sees this and go, oh, it's so beautiful, it's a little baby and this is what women want when they come in for an ultrasound now. Of course, this is what the old ultrasound machines looked like. They were these huge contraptions and who knew what we were doing to women back then, but that's what it looked like. And now we have these little handheld devices where you can like put it in your pocket, walk up to a woman, do an ultrasound, tell her how many fetuses there are, where the placenta is, what the fluid's like, and a lot of anatomy on a tiny, tiny little screen. Okay, but of course there's no woman in that picture anymore. The woman has disappeared. Of course, we all use this picture of Demi Moore because we love to like Google it and put it into our talks. But the woman has disappeared when we're talking about pregnancy and fetuses. Her head is chopped off, her legs are chopped off. <laughs> Right? When we talk about amniocentesis, the experience of the woman, you don't see her face grimacing while this needle is going into her belly. Because all we care about is the result of what that amniocentesis result is going to tell us. Of course, Leonardo started this. This is not new. Okay? This is back in the, the 17th, 16th century when he drew this, that, um, that the woman is lost when we talk about the fetus. So our perceptions have changed. Ultrasounds become much more accessible to people. People recognize the images from ultrasound, as opposed to an MRI or CAT scan, where I think many of you would be challenged and know that these are the kidneys, and that's the liver, and that's the spleen. But if I show you this ultrasound picture, you know exactly what I'm talking about. These are very familiar images, okay? And even when a simple 2D photo tells you a lot about what you're looking at, you can say, aha, that is a fetus. And this is from the Boston Globe just a couple of weeks ago. Testing, testing. It's talking about all these new prenatal tests. And right there on the cover, there's an image of a fetus. They don't have to explain this is a fetus because everybody knows what it is. They, are re they recognize the images. Ultrasound is prevalent. It says prenatal screening options are on the rise, and so are the challenges for interpreting the results. Right? Very prescient. 
These are keepsakes from a childhood that a woman has posted on the web. And if you look closely, there are her ultrasound pictures. Right? These are part of the memory box for our childhood, for our um, kids as they're growing up. Here's a baby shower invitation where you put your, um, put your ultrasound picture in the baby shower invitation. Ultrasound is everywhere. So I want to talk a little bit about language and how we talk about pregnancies, how we talk about fetuses. So we start with gametes, we go to zygotes, we go to embryos, we go to fetuses, and finally we go to babies. And when we start using these different languages, changes. And of course, that is, when do we start talking about the person? When do we start talking about the child and the unborn child? And I can tell you, as a maternal fetal medicine specialist, I have to decide how I'm going to talk about the thing that I am performing an ultrasound on. There's a woman, yeah, I always call her a woman, but then inside, what is it? Is it a fetus? Is it a baby? Well, if I know she's about to terminate the pregnancy, maybe I won't call it a baby because I'm trying to minimize her post-decisional regret. But if, you know, I think that she's really committed to this pregnancy and she's really happy about it, maybe I'm going to refer to it as a baby. But I have to choose. I can't just say it, that thing inside you. I have to say, oh, the fetus looks beautiful. The baby looks beautiful. Which language am I going to use? So when does it become a baby? Well, the dictionary says at birth, but well, doctors will tell you different things. Sonographers, they're doing the scans and saying, oh, your baby's beautiful. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, I'm not going to tell you there's a big heart defect. I'll let the doctor tell you about that. <laughs> then patients, of course, are not coming in. Oh, I'm here to see what the sex of my fetus is. They're coming in saying, I want to know what the sex of my baby is. I want to know what the sex of my baby is. So it also, like, we have really changed how women perceived their pregnancies. It used to be that women knew they were pregnant. Oh, yeah, when they missed a period, they started getting nauseous, but they didn't start feeling that thing inside move until 17, 18 weeks, not consistently until 20 or 24 weeks. But ultrasound shows them this thing moving, all right? It is not just this sort of idea that's growing inside of them. It's this living, moving thing inside them, and ultrasound has absolutely transformed that. And of course, ultrasound is being used for non-medical reasons as well. So ultrasound is out there in society. Tom Cruise, okay, he bought an ultrasound so he could look every time that he wanted to get a picture of his unborn child. Oh. Yeah, it's so cute. <laughs> All right? And this, of course, is condemned by the medical community, right? We have concerns about safety, but really what we're concerned about as doctors is people cutting into our bottom line. We don't want people doing ultrasounds and getting paid for it and having these patients not come to us for their reassurance about the health of the baby. But yes, we are concerned about safety, too. All right, back to Leonardo. This is a womb with a view, and of course, womb with a view is a trademark company that specializes in doing 3D, 4D ultrasounds for patients, okay? <laughs> that gives the opportunities for families to ooh and ah over their babies without feeling rushed, like you would be in the doctor's office. Right? It's big business. It's a chance to discover whose lips, chin, and nose the baby has. Witness, witness your baby's personalities. Right? And we can be a supplemental service to your doctors. Right? And of course, we all know about ultrasound being used in politics, okay? Conducted at the Capitol in support of an abortion bill. That was in Idaho. That was just a few weeks ago. This, of course, is all over in Doonesbury. All right, on behalf of Governor Rick Perry, may I welcome you to your compulsory transvaginal <laughs> exam. Right, so ultrasound is out there. So overview for ultrasound is that it's really changed this technology, how we view the developing um, embryo and the fetus. All right? And both the medical community and the public are affected by these changes. It is more from a diagnostic tool to an entertainment device and even to a political weapon, ultrasound. All right, so let's move on to genetics. This is a DNA molecule, which we all recognize, but who knows what this is? It's a DNA molecule, right? And this is Rosalind Franklin, who was the um, uh, X-ray crystallographer that gave us those images. She didn't win any Nobel Prizes, of course, but Watson and Crick did. And this is the iconic image of the two of them. And all school kids are familiar with this picture. It's in all their biology books. Right? And there's these models of DNA all over the place. We all know about DNA. And again, our view of DNA and genetics has been transformed, okay, from Gregor Mendel and pea pods to, you know, CSI and putting these DNA banks and like getting a drop of blood and suddenly you know where the killer is and where he lives and what he lives, what he eats for breakfast and all from a DNA database. And of course, Jerry Springer gets this stuff all the time with paternity testing. How do I know if the baby is mine, right? You can go into CVS and buy a paternity test. 
you can buy it, okay? And of course, it, there's an additional $149 a laboratory fee that you have to do after you like send in your saliva or your blood or whatever it is you're sending in. But this is big business, direct to con consumer testing. But even beyond paternity testing, you can find out what gender you're having, what sex you're having, um, just by doing a simple finger prick um, looking for fetal DNA, right? Pink or blue, all right? Boy or girl, knows early as seven weeks after conception. It's a combined pregnancy test and sex determination test. It's brilliant, brilliant marketing. And of course, the IVF industry is all about this, offering sex um, determination before putting embryos back in, sex selection and family balancing, okay? ACOG condemns this. The American Society of Reproductive Medicine says it's okay. Sex selection, does this really happen though in the United States? Is this really relevant to what we're talking about? And I'll just present a tiny bit of data. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this study that came out from Columbia where they looked at sex ratios in two different populations. And the sex ratio is the number of males to number of females born. And it should be just a little bit over one. There's sl slightly more males always born. And this is, ba this is um, the sex ratio for your first child if your second child, if your first one was girl, the sex ratio is about one. If it was a boy, your sex ratio is about one. It stays about one even when you have a third child. But in the second population, the sex ratio changes depending on what your first child was and what your first two children were. And if you had a girl, your sex ratio increased for your second child. And if you had two girls, then it increased dramatically so that there were many more boys born in this population. And of course, this was whites and Asians in the United States. I think it was Chinese, Koreans, and, and South Asians. In the United States, this is from the 2000 census data. Now, nobody knows why the data looks this way. We don't know why there's this prevalence of boys. We don't know what kind of testing they're using, whether this is prenatal diagnosis with ultrasound or CVS tests, we do not know. All we know is that this is what the data looks like. And I can tell you, I know that patients come in to find out what the sex of the baby is and then go and make their abortion appointment afterwards. This happens in our unit and there's nothing we can do about it because somebody suggested that we shouldn't tell patients about the sex of the baby at the prenatal ultrasound, which would be a great thing if everybody wouldn't do it. But the problem is if I choose not to do it, the patient will just go next door and get that information and my unit will close. So I'm stuck. So public knows about DNA, they know about genetics and people are willing to use this knowledge. And of course, there's better technologies now, and I'm not, everybody has talked about this. We used to like sequence DNA on these big slabs of gels, and that was my first job right out of college, where you'd maybe get like 100, 150 base pairs and then a after an afternoon's work. And now we can get millions of base pairs just within a few hours using these new technologies. And this is a, a DNA chip here. Council, everybody has talked about council today. Their values are that they believe in genetic testing as a human right, not a luxury, right? We believe children deserve healthy lives, free from genetic disease, right? You know, they're not talking about the children that the patients are aborting, they're talking about the children that actually survive. And we believe in universal access, especially for those most in need. All right? And again, this is that list, and it's so small you can't read it because there's so many diseases that council is testing for. And now we have cell-free DNA from Veronata, Maternity 21. It's clear, it's convenient, and it's compelling. Okay? Don't take it from me, take it from them. And with this test, you'll receive impactful information. I had to look that up to see if it was really a word. <laughs> impactful. Okay? To use when counseling couples regarding their pregnancy. And I know it hasn't made it here to Cleveland, but we've been bombarded with the, um, with the representatives from these companies on the East Coast. Yeah, oh yeah, it's here, okay. So microwaves are, are the next thing. We used to just look at the 23 chromosomes and think, great, everything looks fine. And now we're looking at these micro deletions, these duplications, and we don't know what to say about many of them, and it's gonna be very confusing for people. And of course, both of these things are putting um, uh, uh, different pressures on women. Like there's a move towards less invasive testing with cell-free DNA and our new ultrasound technologies, but we're actually moving towards more invasive testing with microarrays because that will give us much more information at the time of amniocentesis. Of course, if we do all this in early pregnancy with whole genome testing, then that will obviate the need for any kind of invasive testing. And of course, maternal fetal medicine specialists are scared about that because if we're not doing invasive testing, how are we going to make money when because all our money is hemorrhaging into the pockets of the genetic counselors that we're hiring, <laughs> right? So what is, what is the poor woman to do? What is the poor woman to do? What's the poor doctor to do with all of these confusing tests? 
So where are we heading? Well, there's going to be more information available. I think we have all agreed on that, okay? Whether it's carrier testing, cell-free DNA, and microarrays, and there's going to be information available earlier. Preconception sometimes, ultrasound, cell-free DNA. And maybe there's going to be more treatable diseases. Maybe we're actually doing this other than for search and destroy, as somebody mentioned earlier, right? In the past, there were very few things that we would find with prenatal diagnosis that we could treat. Fetal anemia, we could do transfusions. Rare tumors we might be able to treat. We used to think we could t treat diaphragmatic hernias, but we're very poor at doing that. But maybe now there are more. There's better surgical techniques, microsurgical techniques. We can get into the uterus, I'm sorry, into the woman and then into the uterus in order to do these surgeries, right? And now we can treat neural tube, that was purposeful, please. Okay, neural tube defects, the management of melingomyocele study, the MOMS trial showed us that actually we can fix spina bifida. Well, not fix it exactly, but maybe improve the outcomes for kids who have spina bifida by operating on them while they're still inside the uterus. Twin to twin transfusion, we're much better at treating those pregnancies now. People are putting small balloons into fetuses and blowing up the aortic valve when it's stenotic. Um, and fetal shunts are sort of a mainstay of, a, of the MFM's job. And now we have this explosion of fetal care centers. Um, and these are just various places, Cincinnati, UCSF, the Field of Concerns program, which was one of my favorite ones, which is, I think is in Wisconsin. Uh, we, we argue all the time about whether fetuses have interests, and now they have concerns on top of that. <laughs> so, and sometimes they keep the mom in the title, like the maternal and fetal treatment, the maternal fetal care center. But for the most part, once they go down the road of fetal surgery, it's in a fetal care center, and you lose the woman. So where are we heading? Maybe more treatable diseases, not just surgery, all right? Surgery is just one thing that we can do to pregnant women. We can do other things, all right? We can give them medicines. So we can give corticosteroids. This is a mainstay of treatment for prematurity now. We can give them antibiotics. We do that. Uh, progesterone, all these medicines that we give pregnant women to help their babies. Antirhythmic agents we use. Steroids for congenital adrenal hyperplasia, very controversial. Should we be even thinking about this as a disease? It's just uh, difference in, in the genitals that it leads to, but maybe a difference in brain development that people want to avoid. Very controversial. The intersex community is all about, um, about this issue. Maybe we're going to start treating Down syndrome antenatally and improving outcomes for kids with Down syndrome. You think, this is science fiction, but it's not. Right? Prenatal treatment prevents learning deficit in Down syndrome model. This is Kathy Spung here for the NIH. This is big time research now where people are looking at ways to improve the outcomes for kids who have Down syndrome. What a laudable, huh? What's the model? Um, I think it was a mouse model. I think it was a mouse. It's a mouse. Right? This is the way of the future. Well, that's confusing because what's a woman to do, right? What's a a good woman to do, right? <laughs> Screening a diagnostic test, they become cheaper, safer, more accurate. So maybe women are going to feel pressure to do these tests. All right? Easier to fuse amniocentesis because there's still a risk of miscarriage. But to decline a simple blood test, we talked about it. How are you going to say no to a blood test, right? You're getting blood drawn all the time. And when fetal treatment's available, how does that affect women's abilities to make informed choices without coercion? Like, look, your fetus has X. There's good treatment for X at the fetal care center. You should go there and take care of your fetus's problem, right? Because that's what motherhood is all about. It's sacrificial, selfless. And maybe that's not the best way to construct motherhood. So I have many concerns, as it has become apparent, I think, in my talk, that we have great power with this technology, okay? But it will be used for non-medical purposes. I think we can't escape that. Um, I think we maybe can control some of this, but not all of it, not all of it, because people are still going to ask what the sex of the baby is, and we have to decide whether we're going to tell them that. There's an explosion of information. The confusion for practitioners and patients alike is, is really uh, enormous. And we saw this back in the day with cystic fibrosis 
um, when that came online, that people just had no idea how to counsel patients. We still don't know how to counsel patients about cystic fibrosis. Well, there's uh, you know, hundreds of mutations that we're testing for now, and we don't know what many of them mean. And so these poor patients get this information and then have to make decisions, and we can't give them good information. And that's just one little test. And we're testing for hundreds and then whole genomes. It's going to be confusing. And I, I worry about sort of the coercion of women to be doing these tests. Like, oh, it's just information. Information is power. You should do the test. And then they're stuck with the information and the anxiety it provokes and the further testing it leads to. And maybe it's not so subtle, some of that. And we've talked about this, the commodification of children, right? That this is a real worry, that we're just trying to get better and better babies, designer babies, right? Right? Let's find the IQ gene, because if we could select for those embryos that were smarter, why not? Why not get a smarter baby if you could, right? Of course, isn't this eugenics? And as a nice Jewish boy, I know that if the Nazis did it, it's bad, right? <laughs> right? And this is eugenics, right? You also bear the burden. I mean, these, these are very expensive people to hold on the shoulders of this broad Aryan youth. Right? But of course, it's not the Nazis that invented eugenics, it's the United States, okay? We started it here, and, and we are continuing it here. Pre-implantation diagnosis is disease control. It's not eugenics. Let's not call it a bad word. Let's call it something else. And then this just came out toward an ethical eugenics, the case for mandatory, mandatory pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, right? Dr. Jacob isn't, Dr. Apple isn't in the room, is he? <laughs> okay, good, good, good. Oh, Brave New World. So, you know, and you notice that both from Brave New World and Gattaca, they use the DNA <coughs> imagery in their ads. Like, it's so prevalent in our mindset. Okay, so where are we going? What are we doing? Well, how can we avoid some of these pitfalls besides hiring genetic counselors, right? That's how we do it, right? Well, good science, right? We should be testing for disease and not necessarily life-enhancing traits and not sex. Please let us not test for sex. And good counseling, it has to be thought timely, thorough, non-directive. I could talk for hours about non-directive counseling and how you can't do it well. <laughs> so our goal, of course, is healthy children. And I thought, you know, I know it's like an academic symposium, but I'm going to end with a picture of my two commodities. No. I mean children, my two children. <laughs> okay? And believe me, you can't control what you get. You can't. You can try. You can say you want a healthy child and they'll try to give you a healthy child. You can say that you want a child that has a good personality and clearly they have great personalities. But everything that happens from birth until 18, 24, whenever you can get rid of them, um, you have very little control over it. Very little control. And it's a myth that all of this prenatal testing is going to give patients more control over what they get. Thanks. Well, I think we've got a little light under the, in the fuse, and we'll have an energetic panel discussion following that talk for sure. Uh, our panelists are uh, Professor Elena Gates, who's the Division Director and Vice Chair of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of California, San Francisco, Deborah Pergament, who's the Managing Attorney at the Children's Law Group, and Barbara Bernhardt, who's one of these extraordinarily well-paid genetic counselors and a uh, <laughs> uh, clinical professor of medicine and co-director of the Penn Center for the Integration of Genetic Healthcare Technologies at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, if those of you are interested in learning more about their bios, uh, there's uh, additional information in the program book, too, if you'd like to do that. Professor Gates? You all sit here? Um, yeah, I'll find, I think I'll find it. I can close this one, right? And then I can find it here. You'll see, too, because I found most of my slides appeared in the first two sections of this talk. So I took advantage of PowerPoint and did a little bit of rearranging, if I can get this to start. How about that? Great. OK. So this is actually good. This is sort of what Steve just told us. I, I think uh, after listening to people this morning, it's quite clear that there's this tidal wave coming of new technologies that 
we aren't really going to be able to triage effectively. A lot of them are direct to consumer, available. Patients are coming to us as individuals. But we need to sort of think together about how we might be able to uh, at least uh, help them to be more beneficial than harmful uh, overall. Um, I want to get back to this poor council organization. This is the one that uh, a lot of my patients have read about. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. People are very into social media and high technology. Uh, I'm just going to back up for one second and say uh, what I'm going to do over the next 10 minutes is actually choose a few points that I was going to go briefly over in my talk and drill down on them a little bit because so much has been covered really articulately already. Uh, and this has to do with this idea of prevention and the question of how, how genetic testing really is preventing, how you can protect your baby from genetic disease with having a test before pregnancy. Because there's no baby if you decide not to have the baby, sorry, that, um, that's going to be affected with the particular illness. So it's an interesting use of, of terminology. I'm going to grab this. I think it's still on. Right? Yeah. Good. Okay. The other thing that we heard um, earlier today from Eric, who uh, I think shares no, okay, who shares a few thoughts with me about this uh, eugenics threat, uh, and Steve mentioned that a little bit too, is that at least our uh, public health and government sources in the U.S. are trying to convince us that this really is not about cleaning up the gene pool or uh, phenotypic prevention. Uh, and he also raised the question about whether abortion was primary prevention. Um, a lot of these um, sources that are talking about preconception screening uh, cite prenatal genetic diagnosis as prevention, but I'd argue that's not probably primary prevention either. The use of language is something that I think we could perhaps inform a little bit by being more thoughtful. Um, I do worry about sort of slipping into a eugenic frame of mind sort of under the guise of science and genetic responsibility, which I'll talk about a, a little bit more in a minute. These are all quotes that I found on the council website. What's the secret to improving public health while cutting costs? The question has consumed Washington, but it's being answered elsewhere by doctors offering a new test for more than 100 rare recessive genes, some of which cause fatal diseases. Um, the second, I took the names off just because I thought that would be nice to the people who are speaking. The second one um, talks about this being as preventive as medicine gets. This test could eliminate all single recessive gene diseases. And the bottom one's by a professor who says universal genetic testing can drastically reduce the incidence of genetic diseases and very well may eliminate many of them. So these are people from industry and people from academic medicine all sort of thinking that this is where we ought to be going by using these tests that are now being advertised directly to our patients. As I was sort of reading, um, I, I was interested in the concept of what it means to be labeled a carrier. And those of you who are genetics counselors may have more to say about that in the discussion. It was something I hadn't really thought a whole lot about before because I just have my patients screen typically for CF or hemoglobinopathies after a little discussion and it's not such a big deal. There is a lot of really interesting literature, particularly from the Fragile X uh, literature, on what it means to find out that you carry this uh, condition, which is passed along uh, pretty to, with pretty severe outcomes, typically to one's sons and, and grandsons, and a really interesting article about what it means to be a grandmother and find out that you carry this uh, abnormal X chromosome that was passed along to your grandson and he's now affected. Um, a lot of guilt stigma uh, by males against females who are determined to be carriers of the abnormal X uh, chromosome. And so I think that's something that we might want to appreciate more from the perspective of a primary OBGYN provider. Uh, and the second thing I found is that 
when one is found to be a carrier, there's this sort of duty to then be a messenger and think about who else in the family needs to know this information. It's not just my business, it's really my family's business. How am I going to tell people? Uh, these are quotes from some of the um, interviews that have been published. Um, opening up a minefield, I can tell them, but they're not going to understand. Worrying about what it might do to family relationships to be passing on um, this information, but feeling a real responsibility uh, to deal with the information that one has gained. So this is sort of a new idea just in the last hour and a half, so you can shoot it down, but I thought I'd put it out there for the sake of discussion. Maybe we should really be focusing more on pre-reproductive genetic testing um, and look back maybe with a modern eye on some of the experience that many of us read about when we were in medical school or bioethics school about Cyprus and, and the Middle East where they have pretty population wide uh, screening programs for the most prevalent conditions. Those are conditions, by and large, that people are familiar with. They live with them in their families, and that's why the, uh, the population is interested in them. It's, it's a public health model. Most people are tested. There is still some stigma associated, but it's been pretty effectively disconnected from the individual couple with the pregnancy that's trying to decide over some brief period of time what they're going to do about this abnormal finding in this particular pregnancy. Um, in, uh, in some populations um, in Canada, uh, for example, there's some interesting literature on high school programs uh, for Tay-Sachs and hemoglobinopathy screening, which I thought might be informative for us. We heard over and over again today about how there's just more and more and more information that needs to be covered, understood, dissected, and decided upon within two or three months during a pregnancy, and I just think it's not feasible. So getting people thinking about these conditions beforehand, I think, might be a good way to go. And this is where something like this council test, or at least offering CF or hemoglobinopathy screening along with the birth control pills to the 25-year-old might be a reasonable thing to start doing. I know many of us do this when someone comes in and says they want to get pregnant, but maybe we should be moving it even earlier. So this is my assertion for us. Uh, if we all had this test for 100 uh, plus mutations, one of my geneticists can tell me the answer. How many, how many of these would I have, probably? Nine? Five? Okay, so this is normal. So maybe we want to normalize it and start talking about it. And, and people talked about Sesame Street and cartoons and online uh, education. That young people now are, are, they are getting high school biology for the most part. They know about Mendelian genetics. And I think they have a little bit of framework within which we can start talking to them. I do a lot of ongoing birth control and cancer screening education with my patients when they come in. Now, we don't have to do pap smears every year, so we have an extra five minutes that we can use to talk about uh, genetics. And also, I think, have time if we start at 22 or 23 to maybe get people to learn a little bit about the conditions for which they are carriers. Um, and maybe getting some population interest going could get us farther down the road towards developing interventions because I wanted to stop on a, on a sort of a optimistic note. So carrying a mutation is the new normal. That's where I'll end. Thanks. If, if I were, or if all of us were to do this council test, which has like, what, 110 or some, I think all of us would have something. Yeah. 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 And maybe more than something. So that's normal to have to be mute. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, I don't do slides, I'm a lawyer, and since there's been a lot of jokes at my expense, I'm going to tell another one because I, I am secure enough in myself that I can laugh at myself. Um, 
You should all know that, yes, Dr. Eugene Pergman is my father. My mother is a psychoanalytically oriented psychologist, so the joke is, why did I have to go to law school? Well, someone had to mediate the nurture versus nature debate that occurred every day <laughs> at the dinner table. Um, so also um, following in Steve's footsteps in terms of in the interest of full disclosure, you should know that I spend about half my time in private practice and half my time as a clinical uh, instructor at DePaul College of Law in Chicago. And in private practice, my focus is twofold. I work um, representing or mainly actually counseling healthcare providers um, who offer genetic services and mental health services. Um, but the primary focus of my private practice is I represent families, many of whom are affected by genetic syndromes, in uh, actions against public school systems when they're trying to get more appropriate placements or educational services for their children. So my uh, life basically straddles um, the divide that we are increasingly seeing as part of the political and social discourse in this country. When I told my dean at DePaul that I was giving this talk, she said, well, how, now you know how it feels to be, um, have your, your life's work t discussed every day in the media. I should note that she used to be on the Casey Anthony defense team, so her uh, perspective is quite interesting. Um, I'm going to sort of tell you, and also in the interest of full disclosure, that I, I want to sort of refute and add to some of the statements my colleagues made today. Dr. Lyerly asked whether or not we were going to talk about reproductive control or reproductive choice. I'm firmly in the camp of reproductive choice. I'm also in the, the, the camp that uh, Steve talked about, and I'd like to uh, pay sort of homage to my mother's field and quote from uh, D.W. Winnicott, the British psychoanalyst and pediatrician, there is no such thing as a baby without a mother and there is no such thing as a mother without a baby. And one of the, what I want to um, focus on today is that, w that the current political and social and legal discourse has made um, the mother and baby enemies, and I think we need to address that. I think we also need to realize that although some women report that they undergo prenatal diagnosis because they were acting in response to external forces such as social expectations or their physician's directive, pre pregnant women consciously seek prenatal genetic diagnosis to gain reassurance and information that enables them to exercise autonomy over their reproductive choices. And we've talked at great length today about the accelerating pace of research, which is broadening the range of inherited disorders that be can be identified in clinical practice. And because of this, we're seeing that clinical responsibilities are becoming increasingly more complex as Newark uh, technologies such as array CGA, non-invasive prenatal diagnosis, and sequencing of the entire genome are introduced into the practice of reproductive genetics. So as we've learned today with the availability of direct-to-consumer testing and non-invasive prenatal diagnosis, near-universal prenatal genetic diagnosis may soon become a reality. As Virginia Woolf said, we think back through our mothers if we are women, therefore I think we need to again address what we began with today, which was a discussion about what we were addressing in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. And that is we were looking at, mainly from a social justice perspective, the historic legacy of the eugenics movement, the continuing and persistent and pervasive discrimination resulting from the exclusion of people with disabilities as equal and participating members of society. Another social justice concern was addressing the social, economic, and gender inequities that result from the biologically and socially determined fact that pregnancy and the choices that surround it, including whether and how to use prenatal genetic technologies, um, obligate a pregnant woman to assume primary responsibility within the family constellation to reduce, avoid, or manage disability, both in terms of the immediate issue of fetal health and future issues related to nurturing and rearing of children and parenting. Pregnant women carrying f 
fetuses affected by genetic conditions must confront questions that frankly lend themselves to an entire body of philosophical literature, what makes for a good life, and how they measure and value health and human capacity. Pregnancy not only has become, for some women, a tentative experience pending the results of amnio or CVS, but prenatal genetic technologies have altered the very nature of pregnancy and the culture of, women, of motherhood. I would like to return for a few moments to, the few, to a few key words in the title of the symposium, new technologies, new challenges. In thinking about this symposium's title, especially the terms new challenges, my mind turned to the English language formulation of Jean-Baptiste Alphonse Carr's famous epigram, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Clearly, Prenatal genetic diagnostic technologies may be advancing, but we are still mired in the same quandaries about what individual rights do pregnant women have to use these technologies. We continue to, to, to struggle with what Ruth Farrell described as foundational questions. We also struggle with defining the responsibilities clinicians have to inform their patients about the consequences resulting from the exercising of those rights to use prenatal genetic technologies, including both pregnancy termination and the possible course of life experiences resulting from a parenting a child with a genetic condition. So again, I'd like to turn to those legal, political, and social challenges that we're facing, and I'd characterize that as frank discord over the rights of pregnant women and their partners to exercise reproductive choices with regard to the use of prenatal genetic te te technologies. Um, and I'm going to frame the question in, in a way that Dorothy Roberts has suggested, and that is the current political and social climate challenges us to consider what level of control the state or any other third party should be allowed over the individual right to exercise rational choice in the utilization of prenatal genetic diagnosis. I would also like us to consider the dichotomy resulting from efforts to create and to enforce public policies that mandate state involvement in reproductive health justified by what I would argue is the mendacious admiration for people with disabilities, while paradoxically, as Roberts has suggested, promoting the neoliberal state's transfer of responsibility that may be the outcomes of these decisions. In decisions to continue to affect a pregnancy, this includes the care of children and dependent adults with disabilities. What Roberts has suggested, and I would uh, agree with, is that this transfer has gone uh, from uh, the public social sphere exclus almost exclusively to the private realms of family and market. So historically, what we've heard today is that the majority of clinicians providing prenatal diagnosis, screening, and testing were most concerned with managing their own patients um, within their own practices and institutions. They did so by relying on the primacy of non-directive genetic counseling, and I'll let my friends over there argue about whether or not you really can uh, do non-directive counseling. Um, the focus of these activities was on maintaining informed consent. We were, we are continually struggling to resolve uh, the dilemmas of what constitutes acceptable standards of care, the prov provision of uh, prenatal diagnosis. Um, that role did not reach much beyond determining whether individual clinicians' actions did or did not result in depriving patient parents the opportunity to make informed decisions in examining the intertwined public policy ramifications of labeling an alleged act of negligence, wrongful pregnancy, wrongful birth, or wrongful life. So more recently, and I have direct experience with this, clinicians have had to seek legal counsel about how to provide non-directive genetic counseling that supports patient autonomy and rational choices within a clinical environment made more challenging by all of the technologies we've talked about today. Um, reproductive geneticists, genetic counselors, and obstetricians are now even further challenged in their clinical relationships and interactions with the pa patients and their, their partners with the government regulations regarding the dissemination of information to pr uh, patients considering pregnancy termination. We're now confronting the potential implications of mandatory ultrasounds and legislative directives regarding the information that must be provided to women considering pregnancy termination because of a genetic diagnosis. 
We have to consider what that means in terms of a pregnant woman's privacy, bodily integrity, and decisional autonomy. Lawyers counseling health care providers now, must now consider how to advise clients struggling to, to provide care that complies with the standards enunciated by ACOG and the American College of Medical Genetics while potentially complying with the mandates to provide information to patients that the health care provider believes is scientifically suspect or even false. These requirements represent, and pun is intended, the state's insertion into the most intimate matters of reproduction, pregnancy, and family formation. There, several people have, including um, one of my teachers and a former Case Western uh, in, uh, professor, Rebecca Dresser, has, uh, s believes is a promising sign of compromise in the battle over prenatal diagnosis, the benignly cast to some prenatally and postnatally post diagnosed awareness act, also known as the Brownback Kennedy bill. Um, our, I believe it can arguably be said that it raises the specter of intrusion um, by the state in reproductive choice and patient privacy. I'm frankly less um, optimistic about the requirements that parents be or uh, pregnant women and their partners be told about the range of outcomes for individuals living with the diagnosed condition, including physical, developmental, educational, and psychosocial outcomes. I believe that, um, and this is based not on empirical data, sorry, Barb, we can do a study together on this, uh, but on personal experience that uh, pregnant women and their partners will um, probably experience some of this as an unnecessary intrusion and coercive counseling. Although the act delineates that the information be up to date, given the highly individualistic nature of potential outcomes because of the variability of phenotypes in affected individuals, um, one never knows what, what is a uh, possible life experience for one family, is that the possible life experience for another. One could even argue that given the limitations on the availability and access to health education, supportive employment and assistive living services resulting from the privatization that I spoke about earlier, the responsibility for disability um, being shifted to the, solely to the private sector of the family, that the mandated information required by the uh, Kennedy Brown Act, Act about the range of outcomes for a diagnosed condition represents the state sanctioned spread of the illusory culture of acceptance and inclusion of people with disabilities, particularly in the increasingly polarized and politicized public discourse about the use of prenatal genetic techniques. <coughs> So the overwhelming of pregnant women and their partners expect and empower their own health care providers to provide guidance and direction in making reproductive decisions. Although ensuring patient autonomy based on personal beliefs and experience should be the focus of reproductive decisions concerning prenatal screening and diagnostic testing, the increasing encroachment by the state on these private choices has added a new dimension to prenatal diagnosis prenatal genetic technologies and the clinical activities surrounding their use. As we think about the rapid changes in prenatal genetic screening and testing options and increasing access and expansion of the methodologies, we are still confronting the essential question. Do we trust women, their partners, and taken in the aggregate, the family unit to make choices that affect primarily them and their children that they may or may not bring into the world? We are still asking in 2012, does the state have an overriding interest to usurp personal autonomy and impose regulations impinging upon relationships between patients and their clinicians? The ownership society values personal responsibility, liberty, and property, and has a tendency to deride community engagement and state investment in eliminating systemic inequities created by disability and illness. In the ownership society, individuals are empowered by freeing them from dependence on government entitlements by making them owners instead, under the belief that as owners, they will enjoy sole control of their own lives and destinies and flourish under unfettered by restrictions or being yoked by unrealistic and overall burdensome obligations to a common good. Societal obligations for the well-being of children and dependent adults are reduced or even disappear as parents are held responsible for their child's education and welfare. 
a child or dependent adult's disability is viewed as a private problem for the family. It appears, frankly, far, too, far easier to spread a dysutopian reiteration of the loss of support argument than it, it um, is f uh, to, to, uh, to expand um, and promote policies intended to result in sufficient funding for education, health, and long-term care, and efforts to provide robust protection from di discrimination. The diversion of attention from identifying solutions for these systemic inequities towards acrimonious debates, such as the ones that characterize reproductive choice as the slippery slope towards rationing health care by having children affected with Downs or Edwards syndrome stand before death panels, and other hoary descriptions of utilization review is what I think is the most current example of this march toward the restructuring, or perhaps better said, the erosion of the social safety net. Such rhetoric represents the concerted effort to rapidly transform any remaining truly public or equitable social, educational, and healthcare structures to advantage those citizens who make no demands on the state and punish those needs that exceed the available private remedies to address disability. Um, so I, I, I'm throwing that out there, basically saying that we, if we're going to have this dual argument that was suggested by the first question this afternoon, we, ha we have a lot of work to do in terms of uh, how we conceive of ourselves as, as a uh, just society. Thank you. Barbara? Can I get, oh, they're on the laptop. Okay. Huh? Can you help? Um, yeah. Oh. <laughs> I can't help you. <laughs> Sorry. It's asking for a password. Um, I don't have to give a lot of my talk because it's already been given, um, but I can um, pick up on um, where Debbie Driscoll was talking about prenatal microarrays. Um, I've had the privilege of being involved with this NICHD-funded study in which 4,400 women were offered prenatal microarray um, at the same time they were being offered uh, fetal chromosome analysis. It's on the desktop. It's behind this. It's that right there. Um, these women were being offered prenatal microarray testing at the same time they were being offered um, cytogenetic analysis. Um, I've had a long interest in how patients make uh, decisions under conditions of uncertainty, and I approached Ron about um, whether or not he'd be interested in uh, having me talk to some of these women about their experiences with abnormal microarray testing. And he, um, Fortunately, was very agreeable to me part, uh, collaborating with him, and I was also able to part, uh, to interview some of the genetic counselors and some of the obstetricians who were involved with women in this study. So let me just get myself caught up here. Um, when um, Ron Wapner presented data from the study uh, a couple months ago at a major. Um, national obstetrics meeting, um, and he uh, showed that the microarray testing was able to detect uh, an additional additional genetic abnormalities in one out of every fetal samples that was not picked up by uh, chromosome analysis. Uh, based on these results, Dr. Wapner has suggested that chromosome microarray testing may replace karyotyping for prenatal testing, and he's actually very serious about this. He thinks that this is going to happen, that fetal um, cytogenetic analysis, um, at least through non-invasive testing, uh, through invasive testing, is going to go away. So um, I conducted these telephone interviews with uh, a group of women, 23 of the women who were enrolled in the study who received what I'm calling positive or uncertain results. The positive results were a result that was positive for a copy number variant um, that was known to be significant. It was for a known syndrome. Uncertain results were reported out as results for which there really was va a great deal of uncertainty as to what the fetal outcome would be. These women all had already received normal cytogenetic results. Um, before they received the abnormal microarray results. 
I also interviewed um, 10 genetic counselors who were involved with counseling these women and seven of the obstetricians at collaborating sites. Um, we audio taped these interviews and I did um, thematic analysis from the transcripts. Um, and I wanted to talk about some of the major themes that I was able to identify from these interviews. Um, the first theme was an offer that's too good to pass up, and we've already heard this. Um, women said things like, oh, I just heard, oh my gosh, you can have these 80 other tests, and I thought, well, 80 is better than what I'm getting. So, so when women were presented with the option of learning more information beyond what cytogenetics um, would learn, many of them jumped at the opportunity. Um, it was free. It would, didn't involve additional sampling. Um, and, um, it de it, and it was testing for more um, abnormalities than could be obtained on cytogenetic analysis. One of the providers said people hear that it's free, more extensive genetic testing being offered as a part of our study, and they jump at the opportunity. They think, oh, more testing free of charge. Uh, we asked the providers um, what percentage of women were accepting this testing, and it was variable from site to site, but on overall it was somewhere around 70 to 75 percent of people were accepting this microarray testing. It's interesting to note that there were three probably main reasons why people weren't accepting um, uh, microarray testing. One, both parents weren't available to have blood drawn. Two, um, some people just did not want to participate in a research project. And three, there were a group of women who did not want this extra information. They were only concerned about one thing, and it was usually Down syndrome because they had a positive screen for Down syndrome. Uh, the next theme was blindsided by results. Now remember, these are women that had already been told that the fetal chromosome analysis was normal, and then one or two weeks later, they were getting the second phone call telling them that there was something that was not right. So one of the women said, yeah, because we got the results of the CVS, I actually thought we were in the clear and we started telling people that I was pregnant. I was pretty much totally shocked when they called me and told me there was an issue. Another woman, the genetic counselor called and told me that the results came back with the George syndrome. It's horrible news to get, period, but after you're told that everything is normal on the amnio, it was just twice as shocking. I'm like, what are you talking about? This thing came back okay. The next theme was really the big one, which was uncertainty and unquantifiable risks. Um, all of these women talked about uncertainty and unquantifiable risk. And this goes for women who were being told that their fetus had a, a deletion that was very well described in the literature, something like a George deletion. They all still talked about phenotypic uncertainty and how difficult it was to make a decision about the pregnancy. Um, you know, they're telling me there's something wrong, but they can't tell me what. We wanted to know what that would mean for our son in the future, and they really couldn't tell us. This was a woman whose, uh, whose baby had a de novo deletion. Another woman said, I was hoping for a trisomy. I wanted a trisomy because we understood it and I deal with those odds. The odds of not knowing is terrible. And the interesting thing for me in talking to the providers, particularly the genetic counselors, was how much difficulty they were also having grappling with the uncertainty of the findings. Um, one, of the, one of the providers, this was a genetic counselor, said, oh, sorry, excuse me, forget what I just said. This was a physician talking about un uncertainty and unquantifiable risks. It's frustrating because there's not a lot of data about these esoteric deletions or duplications. All you can do is say, well, we found a change, but there's only two cases in the literature, and one's walking around and fine, and the other two have severe mental retardation. So next one is the need for support. Um, these are women who were um, being given ab abnormal uh, results at a time that had followed usually a week or two or sometimes even three weeks after they'd been given cytogenetic results, and they needed to make decisions very, very quickly, particularly for the women who were uh, having uh, amniocentesis. Um, and they were 
struggling with, they needed a particular support because they really did not know how to make a decision in the face of the uncertain information that they were getting. And we heard story after story about how these women were actually out there seeking out the information themselves because they were being told, look, we don't know what it means. And they were thinking, if only I could dig deeper and talk to more people, it would become clear to me what it means. So here's a woman, I would look online and try to talk with geneticists. I met with a geneticist here and talked to an autism specialist. And frankly, no one could tell me. I ended up having to go to a crisis counselor because it was very stressful. One of the things that happened was my husband kept saying, well, I'm gonna let you make the decision. And this was really hard because I didn't want to make that decision by myself. I heard the same kind of comment from three of the women who were all health care providers and their husbands were thinking that they were in a better position to use this uncertain information to make a decision about the pregnancy. Here's the need for support amongst my genetic counseling colleagues. We really have a difficult time, I think, dealing with uncertain information and trying to figure out how in the world can I help this woman make a decision, this couple make a decision. Um, and the genetic counselors also were uncertain about whether or not they actually had all the information that was out there that they could share with uh, these couples. One of the counselors said, I didn't get as much guidance as I would have liked. I felt like I was kind of all on my own. I needed somebody bigger than me to say, we really can't tell you. I kind of felt lost like I was dealing with this case myself. The last um, theme I've called uh, toxic knowledge. I've heard um, my former colleague Ruth Faden call this uh, inflicted insight. I think it's the same thing. Um, but many of these women were learning information that they wished they'd never heard. Um, so it took us two or three months after the test to even get ourselves to buy the crib and to do the nursery stuff because we didn't know what was going to happen. And after that, our OB was always checking to see if he was still alive in the womb. It put us off from enjoying our pregnancy. Another woman talked about how she was still concerned about her son six months after he was born. Yes, I still have the, yes, since I had this uncertain microarray result in the back of my mind, if anything happens to him in the future, that will always pop in my mind. You have to have a wait and see attitude. I'm a lot more vigilant. So uh, this is a very small study. I'm actually going to be continuing it um, in the second uh, phase of the uh, renewal for the prenatal microarray grant. But some of the implications are that uh, I think we need to do a better job uh, in the pretest counseling, um, making sure that um, we explore with people what their motivations for and expectations of prenatal testing are. Um, Certainly, the possibility of uncertain results needs to be highlighted in the pretest counseling. And this is because uncertain results are going to be much more common as we move towards genomic testing, especially in the early years of testing when we don't know the implications of a lot of the genomic variants that we're going to find. Um, and I believe that there are many people who, when they think about making decisions under conditions of, of, of uncertainty, may actually choose to opt out of testing that's going to provide them with uncertain results. Specific information about the implications of variant results needs to be ready, readily available to both providers and to patients. We're going to be um, developing a website um, on prenatal microarray for both patients and providers um, as a part of the next phase of the NICHD funded study. So we will have better databases. They have to be easy to use for obstetricians, genetic counselors alike, and patients, because they go to these databases as well. And we have to develop a way to refer patients to um, experts when they need to talk to experts and other people to expert counseling. And finally, um, providers, especially genetic counselors, need more training and support also for dealing with uncertain findings. Thank you. Let's go ahead and have our panelists uh, join.
And, and while they're, they're coming up here, and Dr. Ralston as well, if you wouldn't mind joining us, uh, I can't help but notice the, the multidisciplinarity of this particular panel. It really stands out the way the, the, set, the individual talks kind of fit together and bring different perspectives, too. So well, well done, whoever has assembled that as well. Um, initially, any reactions that the panelists would like to have to the, each other's talks? I have a thought just to see what the rest of you think. Uh, um, we heard about the woman who was uh, struggled because her husband mm -hmm. said, you decide. My sense is that's sort of the reaction that a, a lot of women are getting because their husbands think they're being respectful of choice and at a certain level it's not my decision to make because it's in your body. So maybe it's fallout from all of that. Yeah. Yeah, the, I mean, previous dialogue that we've been having. I mean, the women certainly, I mean, you know, the majority of the women did have their husband's support, but there was a, uh, a significant minority who didn't and wished they did. However, and that, and that and that could be addressed actually in counseling. Mm -hmm. However, there's always that uh, social phrase: "Our we're pregnant, our pregnancy," and when push comes to shove. Um, so I, I think from a, a psycholinguistic perspective that, that needs to be considered as well. It becomes your pregnancy when the, the rubber meets the road, so to speak, and it's our pregnancy <laughs> when everything's going around swimmingly. What's really interesting is though when Ron presented his data at um, SMFM in February, none of your data was there. So like we didn't hear about these stories of the impact of this information on the women. All we heard about was what, how powerful this technology was and how it was going to be a game changer. Hmm. I would like to make a happy comment about fathers. It's been a very busy day and a lot of tough stuff that has been discussed. Back in the 50s and 60s, the babies I delivered were seen by the dads through the glass. Four or five days later, babies came home and the fathers often said to me, I didn't feel like it was really mine until I got it home and held it. Starting with ultrasound, of course, the dads got really involved. It was always fun to watch them at the delivery, talking to the baby as soon as it was born, and they'd been talking to that baby for several months through the mother's abdomen. What a great thing ultrasound has done, and that's a happy thought for today. <laughs> yeah, um, my question is to Dr. Alston. I was baffled and frustrated by the end of your talk, and I realize it's because I've been baffled and frustrated for years now by this theme that somehow, it's a theme about uncertainty and about embracing uncertainty. We hear it also from philosophers like Michael Sandel, for example. Um, and I, I don't get this. I understand that I may not be able to make sure my kid doesn't have schizophrenia or some one of 10,000 other things out there. But that to me might make it even more important that I make sure if those are my values and my kid doesn't have Down syndrome. And why we should, and why those two should be in conflict, I find extremely strange. I cannot make sure that I don't get cancer, but if I said to you as a doctor, what the hell, I'm gonna stay smoking anyway, you wouldn't think that was a very good argument. So I'd like you to explain to us what you were doing there at the end um, with this kind of um, peon to uncertainty? Thanks. That's a great question, and um, I, I'm sure it's sort of my bias of being um, an adopted father where I couldn't control anything until now, and now I realize I have no control <laughs> now that I have the baby's home. Yeah. Well, well, very little control. Like, um, like I wasn't there for the decisions for prenatal diagnosis and all that stuff. I can get a little bit of medical history on the, on the women, but as we know, so much of what happens has already happened by the time the baby's out. Um, and perfectly normal looking babies grow up to be perfectly horrible children. And, um, and so you have no, you, I think you have very little control. But I, I think your criticism is, is well, well put in that I think that we try to control the things we can control. Um, and my worry is, is that there's this 
myth that we can control everything during the pregnancy and that women can control every step along the pregnancy and have that perfect baby at the end of it and that it's going to lead women to choose to have cesarean sections because they want to control everything at the end too because they don't want to take that one in a thousand one in two thousand chance that something will happen bad between 39 weeks and when they go into labor so they'll have a planned cesarean section or a planned induction and that that is not necessarily where I think we want to be going um, for why how, not? why not? Yeah. Um, uh, well, I'm not going to touch that. I, I can't <laughs> answer that. It's a great, it, the question needs to be asked. Other comments or thoughts on this question of uncertainty and how some of these technologies might, might shape differing attitudes about what's a tolerable amount of uncertainty? Well, it, it seems to me that if you look back over the last 30 years, you know, we think we know a lot and then we look a decade later and it's like a thousand times more information and then it's a thousand times more information and it's not just the chromosomes but it's the genes and it's not just the genes but it's different mutations for each gene and it's not just that and now it's the epigenetics and the methylation and it goes on and on and on. So uncertainty is the name of the game. I think, I th I think any th anytime you have a technology that's dependent on uh, the application, uh, hu human involvement, it's not going to be infallible and in terms of uncertainty. And I, I don't want to make a joke at Steve's expense, but one of my clients is a very famous residential school for emotionally disturbed children. And the director emerita had a very nice retort when somebody pointed out that 50% of the children who are placed there are adopted. And she said, well, what about the other 50% who aren't? So I comment and question. I, I think uncertainty is inherent in what we do in genetics. I don't think we can get away from it. It's whether we're counseling about cystic fibrosis or we're counseling about microarray results. Um, and I think we're, what makes us uncomfortable is the fact that parents make decisions about whether to continue a pregnancy or not based on what we tell them. And it's very different than the postnatal or the pediatric population where the child is there, they have a set of findings, and the tests that we do provide them with some information and some answers. And, um, and then we try to see if that knowledge can help us um, provide different treatment or learning support or speech therapy, whatever it is. And they also then can identify with a particular uh, group of uh, similar children you know, through support groups, et cetera. So I think, it, you know, there's a sense of, I understand how counselors feel because they re realize there's a lot riding on, on that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know, Barb, if you've talked to Ron Wapner about this, but Ron and I and others have had discussions about the informed consent process and whether uh, when consenting a couple to have a microarray, for example, we need to um, ask them about what kinds of information do they want. You know, do they want to hear about a certain <laughs> variants? Or do they want to know about um, information about themselves that might predispose them to cancer or some late onset adult mm -hmm. neurodegenerative disease? And should we be very specific in the counseling and consenting process uh, and, and really uh, try to understand what information they want. So, yeah. Question, and I have a question for Steve. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think if we were doing a microarray on everyone prenatally who's now having chromosome analysis, I, I just don't see how that's going to be feasible to do given the personnel that are available to do that kind of counseling. The, it's just, it, it's going to take a long time, and of course you'll have to explain to everyone. It's hard for me to imagine a system where you're going to be having some patients learning some things and others learning others. What is the laboratory report going to look like? I mean, we're struggling this, with this now in sequencing in adults and also sequencing in children, and eventually I guess we'll be dealing with it in sequencing in, in fetuses. Um, but, you know, certainly that is an option. Another option is to, n to simply not make some information available, you know, to not return information 
unless you know what it means. But the point that I'm making is that even when you tell somebody that their fetus has DeGeorge syndrome, and you know more about DeGeorge syndrome than anyone in the world probably, you know, um, even with that knowledge, it's extremely difficult for people to make decisions because of the variability. Steve, you talked a lot about ultrasound. And we could think about ultrasound as a genetic screening test. Um, do you? Um, get informed consent from your patients? Or do you do any disclosure about and talk about the limitations of ultrasound? Well, um, we can't. Like, we can't possibly do that because patients don't understand that that's what we're doing. It would take a long time to do that. I mean, we do genetic tests every day without getting informed consent. We send off CBCs every day, and we're screening them for thalassemias when we do that. But we don't tell people that. We don't get informed consent because it would bog down the system if we had to tell every patient about those diseases. And, and I think there's a lot of ignorance about what the purpose of ultrasound is. They think it's just to make sure the baby's happy and to, uh, healthy and to um, find out the sex. And they don't realize that we're screening for thousands of diseases when we do that. And, and I think we should tell them that. Like, and I offer patients the option not to have an ultrasound when they're my prenatal patients. I say, you do realize that you may find out something on this ultrasound that you don't want to find out about. Um, but you know, I haven't had any takers yet. I'm not doing the ultrasound. No, but you're right. Yeah, and I, I think it's something we just don't think about. We just take right. it for granted. Right. Even our first trimester ultrasounds are becoming so good at looking at the fetus. We had a fetus last week that was diagnosed with a missing hand at 11 weeks. At 11 weeks, they find out this. And that's usually something that turned up at 18 weeks or never, not until birth. And, and here she is dealing with this information now. Thanks. That's good. That's power, right? But that's not what she went in for, to do the test for. She went in to find out how far along she was. This is a question that's, I'm going to try and tie together uh, two of the points that Ms. Pergament made. Am I saying that correctly? Yes. Um, um, first of all, thanks for your advocacy on behalf of children against schools to get the education that they deserve. And um, regarding the concerns about the Kennedy Brownback bill, um, I would say that uh, regardless of those concerns, it has never been funded. There's never been appropriation. There was an 800,000 grant through the NIH that then got cut in half and then got cut in half again by the genetic, that what the Genetic Alliance was doing. And I mentioned that to say, to tie into your second point, which is, yes, the, we said earlier in these talks that, I mean, the main concern for these ladies that are having these diagnoses is, is how is this going to impact me and my family and will my society support my family? Will I be able to support this child? And you identified the cuts that are in the social supports that are making that harder to be, to be confident. And at the same time, um, I, the physician, the MFM, who called Sequinom found out that Ohio Medicaid is already paying for that test. So there's an imbalance of where the funding is going, because from the conversations today, there are some key things that it seems people can agree upon that needs to go. If it is all about information, then they need accurate educational materials. They need training for physicians. They need to be, have the opportunity to contact a parent support organization to see what that life is like. But the funding only goes towards the testing. And why isn't the funding also going to that balancing information? And to me, that's the injustice. And so rather than just this be a tirade, my question is, um, who is going to speak out about that? And um, given that uh, Dr. Ralston is the head of the Ethics Committee for ACOG, I mean, is that something that they would take on? As far as the injustice in the public funding of prenatal testing without funding the other needed information. Okay. Um, I would take great issue with you about um, physicians not providing their uh, patients with information. If um, you know anything about the history of the development of medical genetics in this country, many people started their careers in genetics treating children as pediatricians. Um, second of all, the, the primary um, directive, so to speak, of genetic counseling is non-directive genetic counseling. And counselors spend, and uh, Barb Biesacker, my colleague on, on my right will tell you, tell you often spend an excruciating amount of time and detail um, and extend a great deal of themselves professionally and often personally to talk to, to families. Um, I think that funding across the board in terms of information is fine, but when 
uh, we get to actually providing services that are meaningful and beneficial, um, there is terrible disparities. It's much easier to get any form of assessment for both children as well as pregnant women through the Medicare and Medicaid system than actual treatment. Um, and those are some of the in in inequities I'm going to, I'm, I'm talking about. And I also, um, my, my central premise is that information is good and that we should trust women to exercise uh, autonomy and, uh, uh, because uh, it is a central premise of our health care system and our society that if you are an adult person, you have a right to make decisions that are going to profoundly affect you and your family. the whole issue of non-directiveness and of course that becomes uh, perhaps one becomes less non-directive the more actionable a genetic test might become but secondly there are a number of genetic counselors who are now hired and paid for in full by private companies and I think that sure puts non-directiveness in some jeopardy as we used to know it when all of us were just hired by universities and we all did the good things for the good people, so to speak. Um, I think it's a different day. And this is Dr. Fergie, by the way. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I just, I sort of want to make a comment that we've all done such a good job of laying guilt on pregnant women uh, that we are, in a sense, guilty ourselves. And what has sort of been missing from today's discussion? and it's not meant to be a criticism, it's meant to be an observation, um, is that these technologies we've been talking about many times enhance a pregnancy. In other words, the majority of pregnancies are actually normal, and you can use technologies like first trimester screening and non-invasive prenatal testing to give a women a degree of reassurance because as Dr. Driscoll uh, has mentioned, there's absolutely going to be um, a certain amount of uncertainty. And we can use these technologies in a positive way. And I think that also ought to be mentioned as we talk about prenatal testing and diagnosis. It doesn't happen. Yeah, I. You know, come on, let's I, not fool ourselves. That well, no, I, I, I think I think we talk way too much about non-directiveness personally, and I think sometimes it actually gets in the way of partnering with our patients when we're always thinking about non-directive, non-directive, non-directive. We don't share with our patients Cecil what Carter, we think. As he grew, grew older, said, "I get I got less and less non-directive mm -hmm. as I got older." So you know, that's right. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> when, when we were uh, trying to develop this tool, to this decision-assisting tool for Down syndrome screening, we had a lot of debates over whether saying things like, you know, the way that your values are reflected in these different value and attitude assessment tools that are part of it would perhaps be consistent with these test choices. And trying to help the user bridge the values clarification questions with the different paths that one could take through testing was uh, really challenging for us to say it's okay to link those and other people were saying no if you link those it's getting too directive because then you're telling the woman that she should go screening rather than diagnostic testing well we we sort of linked them as much as we felt we could, but that that was a the non-directiveness was a barrier for us too. There. I just want to have one comment about the non-directiveness. Granted, we've been talking about prenatal. Certainly, genetic counselors in general are don't construe themselves as so sufficiently objective that they. They can separate themselves totally from their own values. They may nonetheless posit this as an ideal that they're attempting, but there's an important difference that I think the history of genetic testing and the progress uh, in genetic testing has brought about with regard to that. 
namely the kinds of testing that can be done that have important therapeutic uh, implications such that a test of an adult, the bar BRCA1, is going to lead appropriately to a very directive advice that that person has more frequent testing than anybody else. And absent that non-directiveness, I think the clinician is missing, is failing. And there are more and more, I think, situations such as that which have really suppressed that notion of um, non-directive counseling as an ideal that can always be achieved and that even in some cases should be pursued. There have been a couple of key articles in the genetic counseling literature that are now considered by those of us in the field pretty old, sort of addressing and dismissing this notion of non-directiveness decades ago. And it's so frustrating because it's still the primary association with genetic counseling. And there's a lot of ad adoption of new language around supporting informed and personal decision making and even autonomy. Um, is thought of in terms of autonomy within a family or within a community. Is it, is it, in, it isn't just necessarily an individual alone. So I think there's a lot of the community putting non-directiveness on us, but most of the genetic counselors, when you ask them, don't, don't relate to that and haven't for many years. That doesn't mean we're making decisions for our patients, but people like Seymour Kessler for decades have been saying, what patient have you met is gonna do what you tell them to do? That's just a silly, silly worry. And it was an adoption of a word early in the origins of the profession by a professor at the first program for no really good reason. And we just live with that over and over again, and it's old news. I, think I, I would just like to comment on that just very briefly is that I, I do think that as physicians we have a great deal of power to sway what our what, what our patients do um, and and so that that and they will ask us and and Annie has written about this about what we should do in that situation but 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 we do have great powers. I, I, I tell my students all the time that I can convince almost any patient to either have an amniocentesis or not have an amniocentesis if I really think that she should or should not. Um, but that, that's not usually my role. That's not usually my role. I, 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 as an attorney, I'm less inclined to get rid of a term like non-directive, particularly in light of how charged the atmosphere is and around perceiving the, the, the uh, provision of prenatal diagnosis is ultimately antinatal. When it is not antinatal, I would argue that it's pronatal because not only does it give people some sense of control over reproductive choice, but that information can be used to make decisions that ultimately inform how they are going to control their families and their own bodies. Therefore, that's why I, I think we probably are going to be stuck as um, intellectually distasteful as the term non-directive might be to, to you, and I can understand why, because it doesn't reflect actual practice, but in terms of where we need to, from an advocacy point of view, and also to shape the discussion from a legal perspective, I think we're gonna be stuck with it for a long time to come. But, but we could try to emphasize autonomy and de-emphasize non-directiveness, perhaps, because I think it's the idea of autonomy that we would like to promote. I, again, I think the problem is that the, the political and social discourse is so highly charged, and the, um, uh, people, the professionals who provide um, anything that smacks of, as was termed earlier today, the A word, or approaches that, is so demonized that we're going to have to continue sort of these, um, as unsatisfying as they are, use of terms that, that are, that uh, put sort of much more of a neutral and balanced cast on, on, on professional activities. We have 45 seconds, and uh, <laughs> Jamie has been very patient, so I want to give her a chance to squeeze any questions. So this is, um, this is a legitimate question for the group. Um, no, it's, I mean, it's not a comment, and it's not, it's not a suggestion of a comment, but it's more, uh, I've, we've heard over and over today about this, this lack of time and the amount of information, and providers can't get this in, and it's hard to explain. Is there room here for, and can you conceive of, an entity or some kind of provider, maybe it's a decision coach, maybe it's some 
someone who's not as expensive as genetic counselors that can, I, I, but, but maybe, I mean, maybe it's somebody who's just graduated from college who's been trained in a way that can sit down with patients outside of a provider, um, outside of a provider setting or before a provider setting to give them some of this information in a non-rushed, helpful, I mean, is there room for something like that here? Because it seems like what we have is a supply and demand and a cost problem. There, um, I don't know if anyone here has worked in Kaiser, in the Kaiser system. They had a uh, approach where they actually had everyone come into a group and they, for prenatal counseling, so they had group go over the basics and then you have a shorter visit with the provider. Um, I think group, you know, I sort of tossed out this, you know, with the 24-year-old birth control visit, but group care is something that is really being effective in a lot of uh, areas of medicine. Now we're doing group prenatal care, we're doing group pelvic pain care, and I think group learn about your genome. If everyone starts getting their hundred and some mutations, we're going to need something a lot more organized to educate them. I mean, you could imagine you could give them. people, and if you could fit six visits into an hour, if you could give those six people an hour's worth of information. Mm -hmm. that, Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, but you can't do that for each individual. That's all we do. <laughs> That's why it's so expensive. Not that they don't care about the health of the course, right? Yeah, they help. I don't know. Not that we care about the groups. The groups. Yeah, we do for so um, yeah, yeah. pregnancy. Yeah. No, but it, it's the great idea for doing that. That's why it was a question. So I think we're nearing our time. I, I want to make a Sorry, comment. I love where we've gone this last few minutes. But not in pregnancy. And. I just want to make a comment. I love where we've gone in this last few minutes because we're talking about the culture wars that have taken place over this same two decades since this initial meeting and the politics of reproduction as well. And I hope that in addition to talking about these technological changes, we continue to talk about those ideological assaults as well. Let's thank our panel, please.